Exodus 13, verse 19. Okay, Exodus 13, 19 is where we're at. And then before we start, we'll say a prayer, but let's get to Exodus 13 first and uh, 13, 19. And my head is ringing like a bell today. I have no idea why, but I drank a cup of coffee hoping that would take care of it, and it hasn't. So 13, 19, let's see. That means good for migraines. Yeah, uh, to be. I know, and that's what I thought. So I actually stopped and got, you know, even though I thought I might be late, I thought I got to get a cup of coffee. It didn't help at all. But anyway, here we go. Heavenly Father, thank you so, so very much for bringing us together today and giving us another day with our eyes open and our uh, lungs breathing. And uh, I ask that you bless this time that we uh, will bring honor to you through your word. And uh, please open our eyes to see wonderful and insightful things in your word, things that are uh, just right there for us to understand and to uh, understand who you are and what you intend for the people of the world and help us to properly treat your word and to handle it tenderly and carefully as we uh, dig into it. And may you be praised through this time in our class and in all things, uh, we'll remember to give you the praise and glory and the honor that you're due in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Um, oh, one more thing that, uh, that everybody here knows because we got people from all different backgrounds in here. We got people that you know, maybe came out of Methodist church or Catholic church or, you know, I've been to several different denominations and I am an equal opportunity basher and it's never against an individual. Okay, just so you know, we, I, I, if the doctrine of a particular church is wrong and it doesn't match what we're discussing, I will bring it up. So, and like say, I, I, I'm giving a sermon here next Sunday and uh, I'm going to bash the Catholics, the Lutherans, and the Baptists. I mean, I'm getting down on everybody over particular issues. And it doesn't mean the individuals, it's just the policies that are written into their doctrine, if it's wrong, need to be challenged. So, um, never, heard never heard anybody, and uh, as I've said in the past, if somebody writes something down, it is now fair game. That's all there is to it. And if something is the policy of this particular denomination, it is fair game as a policy. If it, somebody says, this is my stand on this particular book of the Bible, and it's wrong, as Martin Luther, you'll see next week, you'll be appalled at what Luther said about one of the books of the Bible. He's getting called on the, the carpet for it because you can't handle the word of God that way. But anyway, anyway just I want to make sure that Ray knows that, Roy knows that in advance because... Uh, uh, everybody else here already does. If, if I'm unhappy with something and then people are unhappy with me and then we get into a debate and that's what makes this interesting. So, um, and let me put on some glasses because I can't see a thing. I, I can't see a thing. Um, all right, so um, Exodus 13, verse 19. And what was that, Gene? I, I wanted to know. I, I want to tell you something that happened to us yesterday and we went to this restaurant Oh, yes. And I met four people that we used to go to church with in St. John. And uh, we'd never bring up anything, you know. But this one guy that was a full colonel in the Air Force, huh. and he was a 16 fighter pilot. Wow. And he had a stroke here a few years ago, and so we got to talking and everything. And, and he said, well, Gene, I miss you in church. I said, well... I miss you guys too, but we get to see each other once in a while. He said, well, why don't you come back? we got a new pastor. No. And I said, uh, John, I said, uh, it was never about the pastor. It's about the politics and policies of the, the church. Denomination. Right. And he said, oh, we've been through tougher things like that. And I said, yeah, that was in the Air Force, but now I'm messing with God. I don't feel like Man, that couldn't have been a better answer. That could not have been a better answer. So his mouth just dropped. I mean, bam. You didn't have anything to say. Yeah, and Wow. That, that could not have been an, a better answer. It's, that sounds like what Peter said when they were at the Sanhedrin in, in the book of Acts, and it says, you know, we, we order you not to speak in this name. And they said, we got to obey God rather than men. You do whatever you want. You can beat us. You can put us in your prison. But we are going to hold to the authority of God. I'm using that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And asked me, going on, I said, why did you say that? I said, I don't know. It just... Just it couldn't have been better. That could not have been a better, you know. That'll get him to think, won't it? Yeah, absolutely. Now, when it comes to God, we need to make sure that. And next week at the beach, uh, who's I don't think Art will be there, and uh, uh, oh, Pat's right in front of me. She'll be there. But uh, 
it will be kind of a review of what we did here at Genesis 1-1. Why is it, what's that? Good. Yeah. Was a lot. It, there was a lot, and it'll be a lot, but it won't nearly be as much as the, the class here. But it, why do we worship the God we worship as opposed to the God of Islam? Why do we, and how can we know? And what we do is we introduce non-biblical things. We introduce what we can know from reason alone. Aristotle, Socrates, Plato, these people built on a system of reason, of logic. And as it says, we do not determine logic. We discover logic. God is the author of logic and reason. And if he is, then nothing unreasonable will be said about God. So if we can know what logic says, then we can know what God is like without ever introducing the Bible. And then we can go to all the different source texts around the world. We can go to the, the Hindu Bhagavad Gita, and we can go to the Quran, and we can go to the writings of Lao and, and uh, Confucius, and also to the Bible, and we can see which one of these matches what we can know apart from the Bible. And there is only one source in the entire world that matches that. There's only one. And that is why we are all held accountable for our doctrine, is because we can know. And then we can get to this one source and we can say, well, this particular source, the Jehovah's Witnesses say this, but the Mormons say this, and mainstream Christianity says this. Can we know apart from this, which is correct? And the answer is yes. We can know. And I know that was a lot of information and we should probably do Genesis 1-1 again someday just because it's a good review. And as you go through the Bible, you will never see anything that contradicts what you can know apart from the Bible. The Bible is always fully supporting that. So I'm excited about getting started on that sermon. I, man, I was practicing it, got halfway through it, and then I had to go pick up Roy, so I just stopped. But, you know, I practice it every day before the particular sermon. And uh, uh, what I did, Pat knows, I started to break up last night. I, I, I had to stop for a second because I... Uh, uh, you know, and, and once again, art is out there also, so I don't want to... But anyway, I, I was speaking... And I got to point number one, I, maybe it was point number two. And what I do is I practice my sermons out loud. And when I first type them, I'm usually, not always, but I'm usually in tears at one point or another typing my sermons. And then the first one or two or three times I say them, I break down. And I purposely keep repeating the sermon throughout the week out loud until I'm through the emotion. Because I don't want to break down in front of people. But last night I, I started to lose it. I had to stop for a minute and just... To recover because you know thinking of what Jesus Christ did for me and I know he did it for every person here too but what he did for me as an individual I can't get over and when I turn around and I reanalyze what the Bible says in my own words it ah, yeah let's stop let's please somebody read uh, Exodus 13 19 anybody and Moses took the bones of Joseph with him for he had placed the children of Israel under solemn oath, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here with you. Now, do you remember that? This was the, the promise that Joseph made his brothers make. Or, or I'm sorry. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, Joseph made his brothers make before he died, is that you will carry my bones up from under me. And where was that? I think we have a, a reference here. What was that? 5024. Okay, well, I'll just turn there, and if anybody else wants to, that's fine. But 5024, it says, um, uh, yes, uh, and Joseph said to his brethren, I am dying, but God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land of which he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Then Joseph took an oath from the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here. So Joseph died being 110 years old, and they embalmed him, when, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. Okay, so that's the very end of the book of Exodus, and this is simply confirming that that the people were obedient to the request of Joseph, who was not only the ruler of Egypt, but was also the brother that delivered the people of Israel into uh, Egypt away from the, uh, the famine and, and uh, the trials that they were going through. So they are honoring that. They're carrying his bones up. Now, just so you know, and I, I'm going to give you this. There's no proof of this. I just happened to read one thing on a website, is that where Joseph was buried, I might get this wrong, I, I, but anyway, I, I'm going to give it to you anyway, just so you can kind of think it through, is that uh, uh, Joseph was buried in, um, anyway, it tells where, but there is 
apparently, and I have never looked at the map to confirm this, okay? And until I do, and until I sit down and do this study sometime, I don't want to just trust what people say, but Joseph of Arimathea, who was the one that took Jesus' body out of the tomb and had it placed in a coffin, somehow is tied in with this Joseph here. In other words, the same hometown or where Joseph was buried, that's where he's from. So there's apparently a connection between the two. But don't hold on to that as doctrine, okay? I, uh, uh, I, I just read something about that, and at some point, the, the name has changed, in other words, in these towns, and this is the old name of the town. It's just a kind of an in interesting study for you to think about, but there's always these parallels going on that are hidden within history and within the Bible, and that's why, you know, we're searching them out. But um, uh, anyway, please, go ahead, Pat. So, they took their journey from Sukkoth and camped in Etham at the edge of the wilderness. Okay, now Sukkot is, once again, that's what we talked about last night, the Feast of Tabernacles, Genesis 33, the first time a place named Sukkot is mentioned is um, when Jacob came down and he built booths for his livestock. So Sukkot actually means booths or tabernacles. Anyway, there's not the same Sukkot as is referenced in uh, Genesis 33. This is a different town with the same name and all that means is booths. It's Sukkot is the plural of Sukkah. Sukkah is what the people live in. Right now in Israel, if you weren't there for the sermon last night, the people in Israel right now are living in booths. They're not living in their home. And they do this every single year. They build a booth outside of their house, maybe in the courtyard or up on the top of the house or something. And they, it, it's uh, in Leviticus 23, and it's also um, uh, broken down and spelled out more clearly in other parts of Exodus elsewhere that they're to take palm branches, they're to take um, uh, uh, myrtle bushes and all these leafy trees, and they build booths, and then they put them all over there. And what they'll do is they'll leave little spaces in between them. They're supposed to be able to look up and see the stars as they're sleeping with their family. And so they all live in these little booths. And they do this year after year. They've been doing it now for 3,500 years, living in booths to remind them of their time when they traveled in the wilderness is what we're going to get to in the next couple chapters is their wilderness time. This is to remind them of that. But it points to something much greater coming in the future. And that is Jesus. And the reason why is because Jesus put on a booth, a temporary dwelling, a body of clay. And when John uses the term in John 1.14, he says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The term dwelt is eskenesen, which means uh, to dwell in a tabernacle. And so some translations literally say he put on a tabernacle. He is the fulfillment of the Feast of Booths. Anyway, that's the same word that we have right here, Booths. This is a town that they're leaving going into the area of Etham. Yes? How long did they stay out there? Eight days. From uh, it, it, They have a, a holy convocation on the first day, they have seven days in between, and then they have another holy convocation on the last day. And let me, you don't have to turn there, but I'll read this to you. This is from the book of John, chapter 7, which is still dealing with Sukkot. The only reason why I'm bringing this up, and it says nothing to do with the, the one I'm going to read, but it's the same name. Sukkot means booths or tabernacles. In John, chapter 7, it says this. Um, where is it? Uh, i got to find the... Uh, the reference here, uh, Jews marvel, how was there? Do, uh, do, 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 many, however. Let me see if I can find, I'm not going up to the feast, and then it says that he went up during the Feast of Tabernacles, and uh, give me one second, I'll find this. It is in John 7, and it's speaking of the feast, who comes out of me, he does circumcise me. Oh, there it is. Okay, on the last and greatest day of the Feast of Tabernacles, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the Scripture said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And he said that during the Feast of Tabernacles. That was on the last and the greatest day of the Feast, which is uh, the eighth day of the Feast, where they all get together. And what they used to do is they would go and they would get water from a certain place in Jerusalem and they would carry it. They'd have a procession and they would pour out this water, uh, signifying uh, something from the Old Testament. I believe it's from Isaiah 55.1. Anyway, they would, they would recite this portion of Isaiah. They would pour out this water to the Lord. And Jesus stood off to the side of this going on. And he says, if you come to me, you will have living water. You won't just have the water that you're, you're uh, pouring out here, but you will have 
what this symbolizes, which is me. And the living water is eternal life.